The United States throughout its history has had its fair share of weird and wacky individuals. None of them have been quite so unique as the Emperor of California himself. Now I know what you're thinking, what's the fuck? What's in the actual fuck? But dear viewer, today I'm going to regale you with the tale of Emperor Norton I of the United States. Now Joshua Abraham Norton was born on February 4th in either 1811 or 1818. Historians are a little divided on the date, but the latter seems to be more accurate. As a young boy, he lived in England for a while until his father of South African origin moved back to South Africa along with the family. They were they made a damn good profit off the shipping industry, but it wasn't intended to be after Norton's family was killed, well, by natural causes and illness and, well, he was left alone. Poor chap. Anyway, he inherited a whopping sum of around £40,000 from his father's estate and began to set up a new life for himself. Like many individuals of the era, the new American dream appealed greatly to Norton, along with the gold rush. However, Norton wasn't interested in mining gold, or at least not that we can tell. So he set sail for San Francisco, California, and arrived there in 1848. Now, California during this era was a... Well, it was an area of Mexican territory until the Bay Revolt and then it became a newly created Republic of California until they were once again annexed by the United States and granted a statehood in 1850. Life in America was absolutely spiffing for Norton. He managed to rack up a fair few businesses including a cigar factory, a rice mill and an office building. But it wasn't intended to be as the famine in China was wiping out all the rice production causing the rice prices to skyrocket. When a man by the name of Willie Sillern told him about a shipment of Peruvian rice, Norton saw an opportunity to gain further prestige and money. If purchased, Norton would be able to undercut the market significantly as he could get a shipment of Peruvian rice for just 12.5 cents per pound, nearly one third of the going rate. Unfortunately, after putting 2,000 deposit on a shipload of rice that would cost him $25,000 in total, more and more Peruvian ships carrying rice sailed into the harbour. The price of rice dropped from 3 cents per pound, meaning Norton would not only not make a profit, but lose a significant amount of money in the process. He did try to nullify the contract on the grounds that Sillon had misled him. The incident resulted in a two and a half year long court battle with the outcome in Sillern's favour. Norton had to pay the remaining $23,000 and at this point, Norton was near ruin. The banks foreclosed on several of his businesses and properties, he was no longer able to stay at all the ritzy hotels and the social elite wanted nothing more to do with him. By 1859, the once wealthy merchant who had it all was living in a working class boarding house. Now, you're probably wondering about what happened to old Norton then. Well, he didn't give up because that is not the American way. What does one do when they find themselves on the edge of financial ruin, you ask? Why declare themselves the Emperor of the United States, of course, because hey ho, why wouldn't you do that? Crazy bastard. Anyway, Norton didn't really like the whole American political system and thought of it as being a house of cards run solely on monopolies, corruption and oligarchies. Yet he was a fan of the old British Empire that was, well, a beast, so to speak. By this point, the American gold rush had began to die down and thus the economy was failing pretty hard. Unlike anyone we know, right? Looking at you, Greece. Uh, anyway, uh, the Americans found themselves arguing over a teensy little debate known as slavery and the slave trade, which led to a, uh, a moderately fruitful argument known as the American Civil War. Norton, as a sly bastard he is, would jump on the bandwagon here and... Hi, you thought I was going to say purchase slaves, didn't you? No, in fact. He demanded a change in California politics and even stated that if he'd been in charge, then the country would be run very differently. In 1859, he issued a, well, a manifesto of sorts to declare his irritation and annoyance at the terrible political manoeuvring that had occurred by the United States federal government, and two months later, he hand-delivered the following statement to the San Francisco Bulletin. At the peremptory request and desire of a large majority of the citizens of these United States, I, Joshua Norton, formerly of Alcoa Bay, Cape of Good Hope, and for the last nine years and ten months of San Francisco, California, declare and proclaim myself the Emperor of these United States, and in virtue of authority thereby invested in me, do hereby order and direct representatives of the different states of the Union to assemble in the music hall of this city on the first day of February next, then and there to make such alterations in the existing laws of the Union as may ameliorate the evils under which country is labouring and thereby cause confidence to exist, both at home and abroad, in our stability and integrity. 
Now, settlers in the United States colonies did consider themselves to be part of an empire. In San Francisco alone, there were buildings like the Empire Hotel, the Empire Brewery, and the Empire Fire Engine Company, among others. However, no one had been so bold as to declare themselves emperor. It would have been easy to fob them off as a madman, but the San Francisco Bulletin continued to publish his demands and edicts. Not in the first call to the dismantling of Congress and the abolishment of the Supreme Court, he fired Virginia Governor Henry A. Wise for sending John Brown of Harper Ferry's fame to the gallows. Norton was staunchly for equal rights for all, but he couldn't leave Virginia without a governor, so he replaced him with John C. Beckenridge of Kentucky, who was also known as the Vice President of the United States at the time. In 1860, the Congress of the United States convened against Emperor Norton I's orders. In retaliation, he ordered the Commander-in-Chief of the Armies to clear the Hall of Congress. The man was he was addressing was General Winfield Scott, who had commanded armies 15 years before in the Mexican-American War and was by now 74 years old and living in Washington Territory rather than Washington, D.C. The same year, Emperor Norton I declared the United States as an absolute monarchy. In 1869, he abolished the Democratic and Republican parties, obviously. None of Emperor's decrees ever actually came into fruition, at least not because of anything Norton said. Later, a few of his ideas would be independently implemented. As a self-proclaimed emperor with no armies or money to back his proclamations up, he had no real legal power to create a monarchy, fire governors or dismantle the Supreme Court. However, oddly enough, he did end up gaining a power of sort. Emperor Norton I quickly became a legend and was extremely popular among the people of San Francisco. Politicians were forced to humour him because to show him disrespect was to lose votes. As an example of his popularity, Emperor Norton I was arrested once, but it wasn't for conspiracy to overthrow the government or anything of the sort. He was picked up for vagrancy and was later charged with lunacy. His arrest caused outcry, newspapers immediately took the press to urge the public to attend the Emperor's hearing and protest the injustice against his Imperial Majesty and it produced the desired effect. Emperor Norton I was released with a full apology. The police of a chief, well, his name was Patrick Crawley, ordered all police officers to salute Emperor Norton I when he passed them in the streets, and he could often be found inspecting the city and socialising with his subjects. What a guy. Where, the emperor didn't actually live exactly like a king. And his new life did provide a lot of perks though, other than salutes from police officers and a popular name in the newspaper stories. He continued to rent a room in the cheap boarding house for just 50 cents per night. His clothes were largely cast off from his loyal subjects, including a few old army uniforms and a hat that had been given to him by a shopkeeper so that he could be deemed, well, the outfitters to his imperial man. Besides free clothing, he was able to ride on San Francisco public transport for free, and was even given a free rail pass in the state of California. He was also given free meals in several restaurants, including very upscale establishments where he was often treated as a VIP guest, though it's likely restaurant owners did that for publicity rather than out of kindness. Similarly, he wished to attend a play, opera or like, he typically had little trouble acquiring a box for the seat, and was occasionally honoured at such shows. When Emperor I needed a bit of extra money, he went door to door asking for business for the tax due to him, which many fans would hand over. At other times, he simply printed his own money, which was honoured by many businesses in San Francisco as if it was real currency. This is an imperial £10 note from Emperor Norton. With the completion of the Transcontinental Railroad, Emperor Norton became the something of a tourist attraction. Now, you're probably thinking this man was insane, and that's probably true, but he was also a keen businessman, eager to meet anyone who requested as such. And on the occasional times, he, well, he used his self-made promissory notes to trade with tourists in exchange for US currency, with his notes to be repaid in 7% interest in 1880. Obviously, no one thought to collect as they were just wanting the emperor's signature to take back with them as a souvenir. Unfortunately, all good must eventually come to an end, and after 21 years of ruling over the absolute monarchy that was the United States and protecting Mexico, Emperor Norton collapsed onto the ground in central San Francisco. He died before anyone could attempt to save him or take him to the nearest hospital. It was a truly sad day for the citizens of the United States, as well as Mexico. His death was lamented throughout the land, and around 10,000 people paid their respects at his funeral, with some newspapers claiming as many as around 30,000. Uh, that, that, that would be roughly around 13% of San Francisco at the time, lined the streets for a two-mile procession to his grave, which really, really puts into perspective what this man meant to the San Francisco people. And honestly, he's a pretty cool guy.